英語聞き流しリスニング、英語テキストと MP3 ダウンロード、その他の物語はホームページからお聞きいただけます。88thpp.com 88thpp.com Chapter 26 In which are continued the refinements where with Don Quixote played the part of a lover in the Sierra Morena. Returning to the proceedings of him of the rueful countenance when he found himself alone, the history says that when Don Quixote had completed the performance of the somersaults or capers, naked from the waist down and clothed from the waist up, and saw that Sancho had gone off without waiting to see any more crazy feats, he climbed up to the top of a high rock, and there set himself to consider what he had several times before considered without ever coming to any conclusion on the point, namely whether it would be better and more to his purpose to imitate the outrageous madness of Roland. Or the melancholy madness of Amadis, and communing with himself, he said, What wonder is it if Roland was so good a knight and so valiant as everyone says he was, when, after all, he was enchanted, and nobody could kill him save by thrusting a corking pin into the sole of his foot, and he always wore shoes with seven iron soles. Though cunning devices did not avail him against Bernardo del Carpio, who knew all about them and strangled him in his arms at Ronthes by us. But putting the question of his valor aside, Let us come to his losing his wits, for certain it is that he did lose them in consequence of the proofs he discovered at the fountain, and the intelligence the shepherd gave him of Angelica having slept more than two siestas with Maduro, a little curly headed Moor, and page to a Grimant. If he was persuaded that this was true, and that his lady had wronged him, it is no wonder that he should have gone mad, but I, how am I to imitate him in his madness, unless I can imitate him in the cause of it? For my Dulcinea, I will venture to swear, never saw a Moor in her life. As he is, in his proper costume, and she is this day as the mother that bore her, and I should plainly be doing her a wrong if, fancying anything else, I were to go mad with the same kind of madness as Roland the Furious. On the other hand, I see that Amadis of Gaul, without losing his senses and without doing anything mad, acquired as a lover as much fame as the most famous, for, according to his history, on finding himself rejected by his lady Oriana, who had ordered him not to appear in her presence until it should be her pleasure. All he did was to retire to the Pena Pobre in company with a hermit, and there he took his fill of weeping until heaven sent him relief in the midst of his great grief and need. And if this be true, as it is, why should I now take the trouble to strip stark naked, or do mischief to these trees which have done me no harm, or why am I to disturb the clear waters of these brooks which will give me to drink whenever I have a mind? Long live the memory of Amadis and let him be imitated so far as is possible by Don Quixote of La Mancha, of whom it will be said, as was said of the other, That if he did not achieve great things, he died in attempting them, and if I am not repulsed or rejected by my Dulcinea, it is enough for me, as I have said, to be absent from her. And so, now to business, come to my memory, ye deeds of Amadis, and show me how I am to begin to imitate you. I know already that what he chiefly did was to pray and commend himself to God, but what am I to do for a rosary, for I have not got one? And then it occurred to him how he might make one, and that was by tearing a great strip off the tail of his shirt which hung down. And making eleven knots on it, one bigger than the rest, and this served him for a rosary all the time he was there, during which he repeated countless Ave Marias. But what distressed him greatly was not having another hermit there to confess him and receive consolation from, and so he solaced himself with pacing up and down the little meadow, and writing and carving on the bark of the trees, and on the fine sand a multitude of verses all in harmony with his sadness, and some in praise of Dulcinea, but, when he was found there afterwards, The only ones completely legible that could be discovered were those that follow here. Greater than ye on the mountainside that grow, ye green things all, trees, shrubs, and bushes, are ye weary of the woe that this poor aching bosom crushes? If it disturb you, and I owe some reparation, it may be a defense for me to let you know Don Quixote's tears are on the flow, and all for distant Dulcinea del Toboso. The lealest lover time can show, doomed for a lady love to languish, among these solitudes doth go. A prey to every kind of anguish. Why love should like a spiteful foe thus use him, he hath no idea, but hogsheads full, this doth he know, Don Quixote's tears are on the flow, and all for distant Dulcinea del Toboso. Adventure seeking doth he go up rugged heights, down rocky valleys, but hill or dale, or high or low, mishap attendeth all his sallies, love still pursues him to and fro, and plies his cruel scourge, ah me! A relentless fate, an endless woe, Don Quixote's tears are on the flow, and all for distant Dulcinea del Toboso. The addition of Del Toboso to Dulcinea's name gave rise to no little laughter among those who found the above lines, for they suspected Don Quixote must have fancied that unless he added Del Toboso when he introduced the name of Dulcinea, the verse would be unintelligible, which was indeed the fact, as he himself afterwards admitted. 
He wrote many more, but, as has been said, these three verses were all that could be plainly and perfectly deciphered. In this way, and in sighing and calling on the fawns and satyrs of the woods and the nymphs of the streams, and echo, moist and mournful, to answer, console, and hear him, as well as in looking for herbs to sustain him, he passed his time until Sancho's return, and had that been delayed three weeks, as it was three days, the knight of the rueful countenance would have worn such an altered countenance that the mother that bore him would not have known him, and here it will be well to leave him, wrapped up in sighs and verses, to relate how Sancho Panza fared on his mission. As for him, coming out upon the high road, he made for El Toboso, and the next day reached the inn where the mishap of the blanket had befallen him. As soon as he recognized it he felt as if he were once more living through the air, and he could not bring himself to enter it though it was an hour when he might well have done so, for it was dinner time, and he longed to taste something hot as it had been all cold fare with him for many days past. This craving drove him to draw near to the inn, still undecided whether to go in or not, and as he was hesitating there came out two persons who at once recognized him, and said one to the other. Señor Licentiate, is not he on the horse there Sancho Panza who, our adventurer's housekeeper told us, went off with her master as esquire? So it is, said the licentiate, and that is our friend Don Quixote's horse, and if they knew him so well it was because they were the curate and the barber of his own village, the same who had carried out the scrutiny and sentence upon the books, and as soon as they recognized Sancho Panza and Rocinante, being anxious to hear of Don Quixote, they approached, and calling him by his name the curate said, Friend Sancho Panza, where is your master? Sancho recognized them at once, and determined to keep secret the place and circumstances where and under which he had left his master, so he replied that his master was engaged in a certain quarter on a certain matter of great importance to him which he could not disclose for the eyes in his head. Nay, nay, said the barber, if you don't tell us where he is, Sancho Panza, we will suspect as we suspect already, that you have murdered and robbed him, for here you are mounted on his horse, in fact, you must produce the master of the hack, or else take the consequences. There is no need of threats with me, said Sancho, for I am not a man to rob or murder anybody, let his own fate, or God who made him, kill each one, my master is engaged very much to his taste doing penance in the midst of these mountains, and then, offhand and without stopping, he told them how he had left him, what adventures had befallen him, and how he was carrying a letter to the Lady Dulcinea del Toboso, the daughter of Lorenzo Corchuelo, with whom he was over head and ears in love. They were both amazed at what Sancho Panza told them, for though they were aware of Don Quixote's madness and the nature of it, each time they heard of it they were filled with fresh wonder. They then asked Sancho Panza to show them the letter he was carrying to the Lady Dulcinea del Toboso. He said it was written in a notebook, and that his master's directions were that he should have it copied on paper at the first village he came to. On this the curate said if he showed it to him, he himself would make a fair copy of it. Sancho put his hand into his bosom in search of the notebook but could not find it, nor, if he had been searching until now, could he have found it, for Don Quixote had kept it, and had never given it to him, nor had he himself thought of asking for it. When Sancho discovered he could not find the book his face grew deadly pale, and in great haste he again felt his body all over, and seeing plainly it was not to be found, without more ado he seized his beard with both hands and plucked away half of it, and then, as quick as he could and without stopping, gave himself half a dozen cuffs on the face and nose till they were bathed in blood. Seeing this, the curate and the barber asked him what had happened to him that he gave himself such rough treatment. What should happen to me? replied Sancho, but to have lost from one hand to the other, in a moment, three ass colts, each of them like a castle. How is that? said the barber. I have lost the notebook, said Sancho, that contained the letter to Dulcinea, and an order signed by my master in which he directed his niece to give me three ass colts out of four or five he had at home, and he then told them about the loss of Dapple. The curate consoled him, telling him that when his master was found he would get him to renew the order, and make a fresh draft on paper, as was usual and customary, for those made in notebooks were never accepted or honoured. Sancho comforted himself with this, and said if that were so the loss of Dulcinea's letter did not trouble him much, for he had it almost by heart, and it could be taken down from him wherever and whenever they liked. Repeat it then, Sancho, said the barber, and we will write it down afterwards. Sancho Panza stopped to scratch his head to bring back the letter to his memory, and balanced himself now on one foot, now the other, one moment staring at the ground, the next at the sky, and after having half gnawed off the end of a finger and kept them in suspense waiting for him to begin, he said, after a long pause, By God, Senor Licentiate, devil a thing can I recollect of the letter but it said at the beginning, exalted and scrubbing lady. It cannot have said scrubbing, said the barber, but superhuman or sovereign. That is it, said Sancho, 
Then, as well as I remember, it went on, the wounded and wanting of sleep, and the pierced, kisses your worship's hands, ungrateful and very unrecognized fair one, and it said something or other about health and sickness that he was sending her, and from that it went tailing off until it ended with yours till death, the night of the rueful countenance. It gave them no little amusement, both of them, to see what a good memory Sancho had, and they complimented him greatly upon it, and begged him to repeat the letter a couple of times more, so that they too might get it by heart to write it out by and by. Sancho repeated it three times, and as he did, uttered three thousand more absurdities, then he told them more about his master but he never said a word about the blanketing that had befallen himself in that inn, into which he refused to enter. He told them, moreover, how his lord, if he brought him a favourable answer from the lady Dulcinea del Toboso, was to put himself in the way of endeavouring to become an emperor, or at least a monarch, for it had been so settled between them, and with his personal worth and the might of his arm it was an easy matter to come to be one, and how on becoming one his lord was to make a marriage for him, for he would be a widower by that time, as a matter of course, and was to give him as a wife one of the damsels of the empress, the heiress of some rich and grand state on the mainland, having nothing to do with islands of any sort, for he did not care for them now. All this Sancho delivered with so much composure, wiping his nose from time to time, and with so little common sense that his two hearers were again filled with wonder at the force of Don Quixote's madness that could run away with this poor man's reason. They did not care to take the trouble of disabusing him of his error, as they considered that since it did not in any way hurt his conscience it would be better to leave him in it, and they would have all the more amusement in listening to his simplicities, and so they bade him pray to God for his Lord's health, as it was a very likely and a very feasible thing for him in course of time to come to be an emperor, as he said, or at least an archbishop or some other dignitary of equal rank. To which Sancho made answer, If fortune, sirs, should bring things about in such a way that my master should have a mind, instead of being an emperor, to be an archbishop, I should like to know what archbishops errant commonly give their squires? They commonly give them, said the curate, some simple benefice or cure, or some place as sacristan which brings them a good fixed income, not counting the altar fees, which may be reckoned at as much more. But for that, said Sancho, the squire must be unmarried, and must know, at any rate, how to help at mass, and if that be so, woe is me, for I am married already and I don't know the first letter of the ABC. What will become of me if my master takes a fancy to be an archbishop and not an emperor, as is usual and customary with knights errant? Be not uneasy, friend Sancho, said the barber, for we will entreat your master, and advise him, even urging it upon him as a case of conscience, to become an emperor and not an archbishop, because it will be easier for him as he is more valiant than lettered. So I have thought, said Sancho, though I can tell you he is fit for anything, what I mean to do for my part is to pray to our Lord to place him where it may be best for him and where he may be able to bestow most favours upon me. You speak like a man of sense, said the curate, and you will be acting like a good Christian, but what must now be done is to take steps to coax your master out of that useless penance you say he is performing, and we had best turn into this inn to consider what plan to adopt, and also to dine, for it is now time. Sancho said they might go in, but that he would wait there outside, and that he would tell them afterwards the reason why he was unwilling, and why it did not suit him to enter it, but he begged them to bring him out something to eat, and to let it be hot, and also to bring barley for Rocinante. They left him and went in, and presently the barber brought him out something to eat. By and by, after they had between them carefully thought over what they should do to carry out their object, the curate hit upon an idea very well adapted to humour Don Quixote, and affect their purpose, and his notion, which he explained to the barber, was that he himself should assume the disguise of a wandering damsel, while the other should try as best he could to pass for a squire, and that they should thus proceed to where Don Quixote was, and he, pretending to be an aggrieved and distressed damsel, should ask a favour of him, which as a valiant knight errant he could not refuse to grant, and the favour he meant to ask him was that he should accompany her whither she would conduct him, in order to redress a wrong which a wicked knight had done her, while at the same time she should entreat him not to require her to remove her mask, nor ask her any question touching her circumstances until he had righted her with the wicked knight. And he had no doubt that Don Quixote would comply with any request made in these terms, and that in this way they might remove him and take him to his own village, where they would endeavour to find out if his extraordinary madness admitted of any kind of remedy. Chapter 27 Of how the curate and the barber proceeded with their scheme, together with other matters worthy of record in this great history. The curate's plan did not seem a bad one to the barber, but on the contrary so good that they immediately set about putting it in execution. They begged a petticoat and hood of the landlady, leaving her in pledge a new cassock of the curate's and the barber made a beard out of a grey-brown or red oxtail in which the landlord used to stick his comb. The landlady asked them what they wanted these things for, and the curate told her in a few words about the madness of Don Quixote, 
and how this disguise was intended to get him away from the mountain where he then was. The landlord and landlady immediately came to the conclusion that the madman was their guest, the balsam man and master of the blanketed squire, and they told the curate all that had passed between him and them, not omitting what Sancho had been so silent about. Finally the landlady dressed up the curate in a style that left nothing to be desired. She put on him a cloth petticoat with black velvet stripes a palm broad, all slashed, and a bodice of green velvet set off by a binding of white satin, which as well as the petticoat must have been made in the time of King Wamba. The curate would not let them hood him, but put on his head a little quilted linen cap which he used for a nightcap, and bound his forehead with a strip of black silk, while with another he made a mask with which he concealed his beard and face very well. He then put on his hat, which was broad enough to serve him for an umbrella, and enveloping himself in his cloak seated himself woman fashion on his mule, while the barber mounted his with a beard down to the waist of mingled red and white, for it was, as has been said, the tail of a clay red ox. They took leave of all, and of the good Maritornas, who, sinner as she was, promised to pray a rosary of prayers that God might grant them success in such an arduous and Christian undertaking as that they had in hand. But hardly had he sallied forth from the inn when it struck the curate that he was doing wrong in rigging himself out in that fashion, as it was an indecorous thing for a priest to dress himself that way even though much might depend upon it, and saying so to the barber he begged him to change dresses, as it was fitter he should be the distressed damsel, while he himself would play the squire's part, which would be less derogatory to his dignity, otherwise he was resolved to have nothing more to do with the matter, and let the devil take Don Quixote. Just at this moment Sancho came up, and on seeing the pair in such a costume he was unable to restrain his laughter. The barber, however, agreed to do as the curate wished, and, altering their plan, the curate went on to instruct him how to play his part and what to say to Don Quixote to induce and compel him to come with them and give up his fancy for the place he had chosen for his idle penance. The barber told him he could manage it properly without any instruction, and as he did not care to dress himself up until they were near where Don Quixote was, he folded up the garments, and the curate adjusted his beard, and they set out under the guidance of Sancho Panza, who went along telling them of the encounter with the madman they met in the Sierra, saying nothing, however, about the finding of the valise and its contents, for with all his simplicity the lad was a trifle covetous. The next day they reached the place where Sancho had laid the broom branches as marks to direct him to where he had left his master, and recognizing it he told them that here was the entrance, and that they would do well to dress themselves, if that was required to deliver his master, for they had already told him that going in this guise and dressing in this way were of the highest importance in order to rescue his master from the pernicious life he had adopted, and they charged him strictly not to tell his master who they were, or that he knew them, and should he ask, as ask he would, if he had given the letter to Dulcinea, to say that he had, and that, as she did not know how to read, she had given an answer by word of mouth, saying that she commanded him, on pain of her displeasure, to come and see her at once, and it was a very important matter for himself, because in this way and with what they meant to say to him they felt sure of bringing him back to a better mode of life and inducing him to take immediate steps to become an emperor or monarch, for there was no fear of his becoming an archbishop. All this Sancho listened to and fixed it well in his memory, and thanked them heartily for intending to recommend his master to be an emperor instead of an archbishop, for he felt sure that in the way of bestowing rewards on their squires emperors could do more than archbishops errant. He said, too, that it would be as well for him to go on before them to find him, and give him his lady's answer, for that perhaps might be enough to bring him away from the place without putting them to all this trouble. They approved of what Sancho proposed, and resolved to wait for him until he brought back word of having found his master. Sancho pushed on into the glens of the Sierra, leaving them in one through which there flowed a little gentle rivulet, and where the rocks and trees afforded a cool and grateful shade. It was an August day with all the heat of one, and the heat in those parts is intense, and the hour was three in the afternoon, all which made the spot the more inviting and tempted them to wait there for Sancho's return, which they did. They were reposing, then, in this shade, when a voice unaccompanied by the notes of any instrument, but sweet and pleasing in its tone, reached their ears, at which they were not a little astonished, as the place did not seem to them likely quarters for one who sang so well, for though it is often said that shepherds of rare voice are to be found in the woods and fields, this is rather a flight of the poet's fancy than the truth. And still more surprised were they when they perceived that what they heard sung were the verses not of rustic shepherds, but of the polished wits of the city, and so it proved, for the verses they heard were these. Greater than what makes my quest of happiness seem vain? Disdain. What bids me to abandon hope of ease? Jealousies. What holds my heart in anguish of suspense? Absence. If that be so, then for my grief where shall I turn to seek relief, when hope on every side lies slain by absence? Jealousies? Disdain? What the prime cause of all my woe doth prove? Love. What at my glory ever looks askance? Chance. Whence is permission to afflict me given? 
Heaven. If that be so, I but await the stroke of a resistless fate, since, working for my woe, these three, love, chance, and heaven, in league I see. What must I do to find a remedy? Die. What is the lore for love when coy and strange? Change. What, if all fail, will cure the heart of sadness? Madness. If that be so, it is but folly to seek a cure for melancholy. Ask where it lies, the answer saith in change, in madness, or in death. The hour, the summer season, the solitary place, the voice and skill of the singer, all contributed to the wonder and delight of the two listeners, who remained still waiting to hear something more, finding, however, that the silence continued some little time, they resolved to go in search of the musician who sang with so fine a voice, but just as they were about to do so they were checked by the same voice, which once more fell upon their ears, singing this. Greater than sonnet when heavenward, holy friendship, thou didst go soaring to seek thy home beyond the sky, and take thy seat among the saints on high, it was thy will to leave on earth below thy semblance, and upon it to bestow thy veil, wherewith at times hypocrisy, parading in thy shape, deceives the eye, and makes its vileness bright as virtue show. Friendship, return to us, or force the cheat that wears it now, thy livery to restore, by aid whereof sincerity is slain. If thou wilt not unmask thy counterfeit, this earth will be the prey of strife once more, as when primeval discord held its reign. The song ended with a deep sigh and again the listeners remained waiting attentively for the singer to resume, but perceiving that the music had now turned to sobs and heart-rending moans they determined to find out who the unhappy being could be whose voice was as rare as his sighs were piteous, and they had not proceeded far when on turning the corner of a rock they discovered a man of the same aspect and appearance as Sancho had described to them when he told them the story of Cardenio. He, showing no astonishment when he saw them, stood still with his head bent down upon his breast like one in deep thought, without raising his eyes to look at them after the first glance when they suddenly came upon him. The curate, who was aware of his misfortune and recognized him by the description, being a man of good address, approached him and in a few sensible words entreated and urged him to quit a life of such misery, lest he should end it there, which would be the greatest of all misfortunes. Cardenio was then in his right mind, free from any attack of that madness which so frequently carried him away, and seeing them dressed in a fashion so unusual among the frequenters of those wilds, could not help showing some surprise, especially when he heard them speak of his case as if it were a well-known matter, for the curate's words gave him to understand as much, so he replied to them thus. I see plainly, sirs, whoever you may be, that heaven, whose care it is to succour the good, and even the wicked very often, here, in this remote spot, cut off from human intercourse, sends me, though I deserve it not, those who seek to draw me away from this to some better retreat showing me by many and forcible arguments how unreasonably I act in leading the life I do, but as they know, that if I escape from this evil I shall fall into another still greater, perhaps they will set me down as a weak-minded man, or, what is worse, one devoid of reason, nor would it be any wonder, for I myself can perceive that the effect of the recollection of my misfortunes is so great and works so powerfully to my ruin, that in spite of myself I become at times like a stone, without feeling or consciousness, and I come to feel the truth of it when they tell me and show me proofs of the things I have done when the terrible fit overmasters me, and all I can do is bewail my lot in vain, and idly curse my destiny, and plead for my madness by telling how it was caused, to any that care to hear it, for no reasonable beings on learning the cause will wonder at the effects, and if they cannot help me at least they will not blame me, and the repugnance they feel at my wild ways will turn into pity for my woes. If it be, sirs, that you are here with the same design as others have come wa, before you proceed with your wise arguments, I entreat you to hear the story of my countless misfortunes, for perhaps when you have heard it you will spare yourselves the trouble you would take in offering consolation to grief that is beyond the reach of it. As they, both of them, desired nothing more than to hear from his own lips the cause of his suffering, they entreated him to tell it, promising not to do anything for his relief or comfort that he did not wish, and thereupon the unhappy gentleman began his sad story in nearly the same words and manner in which he had related it to Don Quixote and the goatherd a few days before, when, through Master Elizabeth, and Don Quixote's scrupulous observance of what was due to chivalry. The tale was left unfinished, as this history has already recorded, but now fortunately the mad fit kept off, allowed him to tell it to the end, and so, coming to the incident of the note which Don Fernando had found in the volume of Amadis of Gaul, Cardenio said that he remembered it perfectly and that it was in these words. Greater than Lucinda to Cardenio. Greater than. Greater than every day I discover merits in you that oblige and compel me to hold you in higher estimation so if you desire to relieve me of this obligation without cost to my honour, you may easily do so. I have a father who knows you and loves me dearly, who without putting any constraint on my inclination will grant what will be reasonable for you to have, if it be that you value me as you say and as I believe you do. 
by this letter I was induced, as I told you, to demand Lucinda for my wife, and it was through it that Lucinda came to be regarded by Don Fernando as one of the most discreet and prudent women of the day, and this letter it was that suggested his design of ruining me before mine could be carried into effect. I told Don Fernando that all Lucinda's father was waiting for was that mine should ask her of him, which I did not dare to suggest to him, fearing that he would not consent to do so, not because he did not know perfectly well the rank, goodness, virtue, and beauty of Lucinda, and that she had qualities that would do honor to any family in Spain, but because I was aware that he did not wish me to marry so soon, before seeing what the Duke Ricardo would do for me. In short, I told him I did not venture to mention it to my father, as well on account of that difficulty, as of many others that discouraged me though I knew not well what they were, only that it seemed to me that what I desired was never to come to pass. To all this Don Fernando answered that he would take it upon himself to speak to my father, and persuade him to speak to Lucinda's father. Oh, ambitious Marius! Oh, cruel Catiline! Oh, wicked Scylla! Oh, Phidias gone alone! Oh, treacherous Valido! Oh, vindictive Julian! Oh, covetous Judas! Traitor, cruel, vindictive, and perfidious, wherein had this poor wretch failed in his fidelity, who with such frankness showed thee the secrets and the joys of his heart? What offence did I commit? What words did I utter, or what counsels did I give that had not the furtherance of thy honour and welfare for their aim? But, woe is me, wherefore do I complain? For sure it is that when misfortunes spring from the stars, descending from on high they fall upon us with such fury and violence that no power on earth can check their course nor human device stay their coming. Who could have thought that Don Fernando, a high-born gentleman, intelligent, bound to me by gratitude for my services, one that could win the object of his love wherever he might set his affections, could have become so obdurate, as they say, as to rob me of my one ewe lamb that was not even yet in my possession. But laying aside these useless and unavailing reflections, let us take up the broken thread of my unhappy story. To proceed, then, Don Fernando finding my presence an obstacle to the execution of his treacherous and wicked design, resolved to send me to his elder brother under the pretext of asking money from him to pay for six horses which, purposely, and with the sole object of sending me away that he might the better carry out his infernal scheme, he had purchased the very day he offered to speak to my father, and the price of which he now desired me to fetch. Could I have anticipated this treachery? Could I by any chance have suspected it? Nay, so far from that, I offered with the greatest pleasure to go at once, in my satisfaction at the good bargain that had been made. That night I spoke with Lucinda, and told her what had been agreed upon with Don Fernando, and how I had strong hopes of our fair and reasonable wishes being realized. She, as unsuspicious as I was of the treachery of Don Fernando, bade me try to return speedily, as she believed the fulfillment of our desires would be delayed only so long as my father put off speaking to hers. I know not why it was that on saying this to me her eyes filled with tears, and there came a lump in her throat that prevented her from uttering a word of many more that it seemed to me she was striving to say to me. I was astonished at this unusual turn, which I never before observed in her. For we always conversed, whenever good fortune and my ingenuity gave us the chance, with the greatest gaiety and cheerfulness, mingling tears, sighs, jealousies, doubts, or fears with our words, it was all on my part a eulogy of my good fortune that heaven should have given her to me for my mistress, I glorified her beauty, I extolled her worth and her understanding, and she paid me back by praising in me what in her love for me she thought worthy of praise, and besides we had a hundred thousand trifles and doings of our neighbours and acquaintances to talk about, and the utmost extent of my boldness was to take, almost by force, one of her fair white hands and carry it to my lips, as well as the closeness of the low grating that separated us allowed me. But the night before the unhappy day of my departure she wept, she moaned, she sighed, and she withdrew leaving me filled with perplexity and amazement, overwhelmed at the sight of such strange and affecting signs of grief and sorrow in Lucinda, but not to dash my hopes I ascribed it all to the depth of her love for me and the pain that separation gives those who love tenderly. At last I took my departure, sad and dejected, my heart filled with fancies and suspicions, but not knowing well what it was I suspected or fancied, plain omens pointing to the sad event and misfortune that was awaiting me. I reached the place whither I had been sent, gave the letter to Don Fernando's brother, and was kindly received but not promptly dismissed, for he desired me to wait, very much against my will, eight days in some place where the duke his father was not likely to see me, as his brother wrote that the money was to be sent without his knowledge, all of which was a scheme of the treacherous Don Fernando, for his brother had no one of money to enable him to dispatch me at once. The command was one that exposed me to the temptation of disobeying it, as it seemed to me impossible to endure life for so many days separated from Lucinda, especially after leaving her in the sorrowful mood I have described to you. Nevertheless as a dutiful servant I obeyed, though I felt it would be at the cost of my well-being. 
but four days later there came a man in quest of me with a letter which he gave me, and which by the address I perceived to be from Lucinda, as the writing was hers. I opened it with fear and trepidation, persuaded that it must be something serious that had impelled her to write to me when at a distance, as she seldom did so when I was near. Before reading it I asked the man who it was that had given it to him, and how long he had been upon the road, he told me that as he happened to be passing through one of the streets of the city at the hour of noon, a very beautiful lady called to him from a window, and with tears in her eyes said to him hurriedly, Brother, if you are, as you seem to be, a Christian, for the love of God I entreat you to have this letter dispatched without a moment's delay to the place and person named in the address, all which is well known, and by this you will render a great service to our Lord, and that you may be at no inconvenience in doing so take what is in this handkerchief. And said he, with this she threw me a handkerchief out of the window in which were tied up a hundred reals and this gold ring which I bring here together with the letter I have given you. And then without waiting for any answer she left the window, though not before she saw me take the letter and the handkerchief, and I had by signs let her know that I would do as she bade me, and so, seeing myself so well paid for the trouble I would have in bringing it to you, and knowing by the address that it was to you it was sent, for, Senor, I know you very well, and also unable to resist that beautiful lady's tears, I resolved to trust no one else, but to come myself and give it to you, and in sixteen hours from the time when it was given me I have made the journey, which, as you know, is eighteen leagues. All the while the good-natured improvised courier was telling me this, I hung upon his words, my legs trembling under me so that I could scarcely stand. However, I opened the letter and read these words. The promise Don Fernando gave you to urge your father to speak to mine, he has fulfilled much more to his own satisfaction than to your advantage. I have to tell you, Senor, that he has demanded me for a wife, and my father, led away by what he considers Don Fernando's superiority over you, has favoured his suit so cordially, that in two days hence the betrothal is to take place with such secrecy and so privately that the only witnesses are to be the heavens above and a few of the household. Picture to yourself the state I am in, judge if it be urgent for you to come, the issue of the affair will show you whether I love you or not. God grant this may come to your hand before mine shall be forced to link itself with his who keeps so of the faith that he has pledged. Such, in brief, were the words of the letter, words that made me set out at once without waiting any longer for reply or money, for I now saw clearly that it was not the purchase of horses but of his own pleasure that had made Don Fernando send me to his brother. The exasperation I felt against Don Fernando, joined with the fear of losing the prize I had won by so many years of love and devotion, lent me wings, so that almost flying I reached home the same day, by the hour which served for speaking with Lucinda. I arrived unobserved, and left the mule on which I had come at the house of the worthy man who had brought me the letter, and fortune was pleased to be for once so kind that I found Lucinda the grating that was the witness of our loves. She recognized me at once, and I her, but not as she ought to have recognized me, or I her. But who is there in the world that can boast of having fathomed or understood the wavering mind and unstable nature of a woman? Of a truth no one. To proceed, as soon as Lucinda saw me she said, Cardenio, I am in my bridal dress, and the treacherous Don Fernando and my covetous father are waiting for me in the hall with the other witnesses, who shall be the witnesses of my death before they witness my betrothal. Be not distressed, my friend, but contrive to be present at this sacrifice, and if that cannot be prevented by my words, I have a dagger concealed which will prevent more deliberate violence, putting an end to my life and giving thee a first proof of the love I have borne and bear thee. I replied to her distractedly and hastily, in fear lest I should not have time to reply, may thy words be verified by thy deeds, lady, and if thou hast a dagger to save thy honour, I have a sword to defend thee or kill myself if fortune be against us. I think she could not have heard all these words, for I perceived that they called her away in haste, as the bridegroom was waiting. Now the night of my sorrow set in, the sun of my happiness went down, I felt my eyes bereft of sight, my mind of reason. I could not enter the house, nor was I capable of any movement, but reflecting how important it was that I should be present at what might take place on the occasion, I nerved myself as best I could and went in, for I well knew all the entrances and outlets, and besides, with the confusion that in secret pervaded the house no one took notice of me, so, without being seen, I found an opportunity of placing myself in the recess formed by a window of the hall itself, and concealed by the ends and borders of two tapestries, from between which I could, without being seen, see all that took place in the room. Who could describe the agitation of heart I suffered as I stood there, the thoughts that came to me, the reflections that passed through my mind? They were such as cannot be, nor were it well they should be, told. Suffice it to say that the bridegroom entered the hall in his usual dress, without ornament of any kind, as groomsman he had with him a cousin of Lucinda's and except the servants of the house there was no one else in the chamber. Soon afterwards Lucinda came out from an antechamber, attended by her mother and two of her damsels, 
arrayed and adorned as became her rank and beauty, and in full festival and ceremonial attire. My anxiety and distraction did not allow me to observe or notice particularly what she wore, I could only perceive the colors, which were crimson and white, and the glitter of the gems and jewels on her head dress and apparel, surpassed by the rare beauty of her lovely auburn hair that vying with the precious stones and the light of the four torches that stood in the hall shone with a brighter gleam than all. O oh memory, mortal foe of my peace! What bring before me now the incomparable beauty of that adored enemy of mine? Were it not better, cruel memory, to remind me and recall what she then did, that stirred by a wrong so glaring I may seek, if not vengeance now, at least to rid myself of life? Be not weary, sirs, of listening to these digressions, my sorrow is not one of those that can or should be told tersely and briefly, for to me each incident seems to call for many words. To this the curate replied that not only were they not weary of listening to him, but that the details he mentioned interested them greatly, being of a kind by no means to be omitted and deserving of the same attention as the main story. To proceed, then, continued Cardenio, all being assembled in the hall, the priest of the parish came in and as he took the pair by the hand to perform the requisite ceremony, at the words, Will you, Senora Lucinda, take Senor Don Fernando, here present, for your lawful husband, as the Holy Mother Church ordains? I thrust my head and neck out from between the tapestries, and with eager ears and throbbing heart set myself to listen to Lucinda's answer, awaiting in her reply the sentence of death or the grant of life. Oh, that I had but dared at that moment to rush forward crying aloud, Lucinda, Lucinda! Have a care what thou dost, remember what thou owest me, bethink thee that thou art mine and canst not be another's, reflect that thy utterance of yes and the end of my life will come at the same instant. Oh, treacherous Don Fernando! Robber of my glory, death of my life! what seekest thou? Remember that thou canst not as a Christian attain the object of thy wishes, for Lucinda is my bride, and I am her husband. Fool that I am! Now that I am far away and out of danger, I say I should have done what I did not do, now that I have allowed my precious treasure to be robbed from me, I curse the robber, on whom I might have taken vengeance had I as much heart for it as I have for bewailing my fate. In short, as I was then a coward and a fool, little wonder is it if I am now dying shame-stricken, remorseful, and mad. The priest stood waiting for the answer of Lucinda, who for a long time withheld it, and just as I thought she was taking out the dagger to save her honour, or struggling for words to make some declaration of the truth on my behalf, I heard her say in a faint and feeble voice, I will, Don Fernando said the same, and giving her the ring they stood linked by a knot that could never be loosed. The bridegroom then approached to embrace his bride, and she, pressing her hand upon her heart, fell fainting in her mother's arms. It only remains now for me to tell you the state I was in when in the consent that I heard I saw all my hopes mocked, the words and promises of Lucinda proved falsehoods, and the recovery of the prize I had that instant lost rendered impossible forever. I stood stupefied, wholly abandoned, it seemed, by heaven, declared the enemy of the earth that bore me, the air refusing me breath for my sighs, the water moisture for my tears, it was only the fire that gathered strength so that my whole frame glowed with rage and jealousy. They were all thrown into confusion by Lucinda's fainting, and as her mother was unlacing her to give her heir a sealed paper was discovered in her bosom which Don Fernando seized at once and began to read by the light of one of the torches. As soon as he had read it he seated himself in a chair, leaning his cheek on his hand in the attitude of one deep in thought, without taking any part in the efforts that were being made to recover his bride from her fainting fit. Seeing all the household in confusion, I ventured to come out regardless whether I were seen or not, and determined, if I were, to do some frenzied deed that would prove to all the world the righteous indignation of my breast and the punishment of the treacherous Don Fernando, and even in that of the fickle fainting traitress. But my fate, doubtless reserving me for greater sorrows, if such there be, so ordered it that just then I had enough and to spare of that reason which has since been wanting to me, and so, without seeking to take vengeance on my greatest enemies, which might have been easily taken, as all thought of me was so far from their minds, I resolved to take it upon myself, and on myself to inflict the pain they deserved perhaps with even greater severity than I should have dealt out to them had I then slain them, for sudden pain is soon over, but that which is protracted by tortures is ever slain without ending life. In a word, I quitted the house and reached that of the man with whom I had left my mule, I made him saddle it for me, mounted without bidding him farewell, and rode out of the city, like another lot, not daring to turn my head to look back upon it, and when I found myself alone in the open country, screened by the darkness of the night, and tempted by the stillness to give vent to my grief without apprehension or fear of being heard or seen, then I broke silence and lifted up my voice in maledictions upon Lucinda and Don Fernando, as if I could thus avenge the wrong they had done me. I called her cruel, ungrateful, false, thankless, but above all covetous, since the wealth of my enemy had blinded the eyes of her affection, 
and turned it for me to transfer it to one to whom fortune had been more generous and liberal. And yet, in the midst of this outburst of execration and upbraiding, I found excuses for her, saying it was no wonder that a young girl in the seclusion of her parents' house, trained and schooled to obey them always, should have been ready to yield to their wishes when they offered her for a husband a gentleman of such distinction, wealth, and noble birth, that if she had refused to accept him she would have been thought out of her senses, or to have set her affection elsewhere, a suspicion injurious to her fair name and fame. But then again, I said, had she declared I was her husband, they would have seen that in choosing me she had not chosen so ill but that they might excuse her, for before Don Fernando had made his offer, they themselves could not have desired, if their desires had been ruled by reason, a more eligible husband for their daughter than I was, and she, before taking the last fatal step of giving her hand, might easily have said that I had already given her mine, for I should have come forward to support any assertion of hers to that effect. In short, I came to the conclusion that feeble love, little reflection, great ambition, and a craving for rank, had made her forget the words with which she had deceived me, encouraged and supported by my firm hopes and honourable passion. Thus soliloquizing and agitated, I journeyed onward for the remainder of the night, and by daybreak I reached one of the passes of these mountains, among which I wandered for three days more without taking any path or road, until I came to some meadows lying on I know not which side of the mountains, and there I inquired of some herdsmen in what direction the most rugged part of the range lay. They told me that it was in this quarter, and I at once directed my course hither, intending to end my life here, but as I was making my way among these crags, my mule dropped dead through fatigue and hunger, or, as I think more likely, in order to have done with such a worthless burden as it bore in me. I was left on foot, worn out, famishing, without anyone to help me or any thought of seeking help, and so thus I lay stretched on the ground, how long I know not, after which I rose up free from hunger, and found beside me some goatherds, who no doubt were the persons who had relieved me in my need, for they told me how they had found me, and how I had been uttering ravings that showed plainly I had lost my reason, and since then I am conscious that I am not always in full possession of it, but at times so deranged and crazed that I do a thousand mad things, tearing my clothes, crying aloud in these solitudes, cursing my fate, and idly calling on the dear name of her who is my enemy, and only seeking to end my life in lamentation, and when I recover my senses I find myself so exhausted and weary that I can scarcely move. Most commonly my dwelling is the hollow of a cork tree large enough to shelter this miserable body, the herdsmen and goatherds who frequent these mountains, moved by compassion, furnish me with food, leaving it by the wayside or on the rocks, where they think I may perhaps pass and find it, and so, even though I may be then out of my senses, the wants of nature teach me what is required to sustain me, and make me crave it and eager to take it. At other times, so they tell me when they find me in a rational mood, I sally out upon the road, and though they would gladly give it me, I snatch food by force from the shepherds bringing it from the village to their huts. Thus do pass the wretched life that remains to me, until it be heaven's will to bring it to a close, or so to order my memory that I no longer recollect the beauty and treachery of Lucinda, or the wrong done me by Don Fernando, for if it will do this without depriving me of life, I will turn my thoughts into some better channel, if not, I can only implore it to have full mercy on my soul, for in myself I feel no power or strength to release my body from this strait in which I have of my own accord chosen to place it. Such, sirs, is the dismal story of my misfortune, say if it be one that can be told with less emotion than you have seen in me, and do not trouble yourselves with urging or pressing upon me what reason suggests is likely to serve for my relief, for it will avail me as much as the medicine prescribed by a wise physician avails the sick man who will not take it. I have no wish for health without Lucinda, and since it is her pleasure to be another's, when she is or should be mine, let it be mine to be a prey to misery when I might have enjoyed happiness. She by her fickleness strove to make my ruin irretrievable. I will strive to gratify her wishes by seeking destruction, and it will show generations to come that I alone was deprived of that of which all others in misfortune have a superabundance, for to them the impossibility of being consoled is itself a consolation, while to me it is the cause of greater sorrows and sufferings, for I think that even in death there will not be an end of them. Here Cardenio brought to a close his long discourse and story, as full of misfortune as it was of love, but just as the curate was going to address some words of comfort to him, he was stopped by a voice that reached his ear, saying in melancholy tones what will be told in the fourth part of this narrative, for at this point the sage and sagacious historian, Sidamete Benengeli, brought the third to a conclusion. Chapter 28. Which treats of the strange and delightful adventure that befell the curate and the barber in the same Sierra. Happy and fortunate were the times when that most daring knight Don Quixote of La Mancha was sent into the world, for by reason of his having formed a resolution so honourable as that of seeking to revive and restore to the world the long-lost and almost defunct order of knight-errantry, we now enjoy in this age of ours, so poor in light entertainment, 
not only the charm of his voracious history, but also of the tales and episodes contained in it which are, in a measure, no less pleasing, ingenious, and truthful, than the history itself, which, resuming its thread, carded, spun, and wound, relates that just as the curate was going to offer consolation to Cardenio, he was interrupted by a voice that fell upon his ear saying in plaintive tones, O God! Is it possible I have found a place that may serve as a secret grave for the weary load of this body that I support so unwillingly? If the solitude these mountains promise deceives me not, it is so, ah! Woe is me! How much more grateful to my mind will be the society of these rocks and breaks that permit me to complain of my misfortune to heaven, than that of any human being, for there is none on earth to look to for counsel in doubt, comfort in sorrow, or relief in distress. All this was heard distinctly by the curate and those with him, and as it seemed to them to be uttered close by, as indeed it was, they got up to look for the speaker, and before they had gone twenty paces they discovered behind a rock, seated at the foot of an ash tree, a youth in the dress of a peasant, whose face they were unable at the moment to see as he was leaning forward, bathing his feet in the brook that flowed past. They approached so silently that he did not perceive them, being fully occupied in bathing his feet, which were so fair that they looked like two pieces of shining crystal brought forth among the other stones of the brook. The whiteness and beauty of these feet struck them with surprise, for they did not seem to have been made to crush clods or to follow the plough and the oxen as their owner's dress suggested, and so, finding they had not been noticed, the curate, who was in front, made a sign to the other two to conceal themselves behind some fragments of rock that lay there, which they did, observing closely what the youth was about. He had on a loose double-skirted dark brown jacket bound tight to his body with a white cloth, he wore besides breeches and gaiters a brown cloth, and on his head a brown montera, and he had the gaiters turned up as far as the middle of the leg, which verily seemed to be of pure alabaster. As soon as he had done bathing his beautiful feet, he wiped them with a towel he took from under the montera, on taking off which he raised his face, and those who were watching him had an opportunity of seeing a beauty so exquisite that Cardenio said to the curate in a whisper, as this is not Lucinda, it is no human creature but a divine being. The youth then took off the Montera, and shaking his head from side to side there broke loose and spread out a mass of hair that the beams of the sun might have envied, by this they knew that what had seemed a peasant was a lovely woman, nay the most beautiful the eyes of two of them had ever beheld, or even Cardenio's if they had not seen and known Lucinda, for he afterwards declared that only the beauty of Lucinda could compare with this. The long auburn tresses not only covered her shoulders, but such was their length and abundance, concealed her all round beneath their masses, so that except the feet nothing of her form was visible. She now used her hands as a comb, and if her feet had seemed like bits of crystal in the water, her hands looked like pieces of driven snow among her locks, all which increased not only the admiration of the three beholders, but their anxiety to learn who she was. With this object they resolved to show themselves, and at the stir they made in getting upon their feet the fair damsel raised her head, and parting her hair from before her eyes with both hands, she looked to see who had made the noise, and the instant she perceived them she started to her feet, and without waiting to put on her shoes or gather up her hair, hastily snatched up a bundle as though of clothes that she had beside her, and, scared and alarmed, endeavoured to take flight, but before she had gone six paces she fell to the ground, her delicate feet being unable to bear the roughness of the stones, seeing which, the three hastened towards her, and the curate addressing her first said, Stay, senora, whoever you may be, for those whom you see here only desire to be of service to you you have no need to attempt a flight so heedless, for neither can your feet bear it, nor we allow it. Taken by surprise and bewildered, she made no reply to these words. They, however, came towards her, and the curate taking her hand went on to say, What your dress would hide, senora, is made known to us by your hair, a clear proof that it can be no trifling cause that has disguised your beauty in a garb so unworthy of it, and sent it into solitudes like these where we have had the good fortune to find you, if not to relieve your distress, at least to offer you comfort, for no distress, so long as life lasts, can be so oppressive or reach such a height as to make the sufferer refuse to listen to comfort offered with good intention. And so, senora, or senor, or whatever you prefer to be, dismiss the fears that our appearance has caused you and make us acquainted with your good or evil fortunes, for from all of us together, or from each one of us, you will receive sympathy in your trouble. While the curate was speaking, the disguised damsel stood as if spellbound, looking at them without opening her lips or uttering a word, just like a village rustic to whom something strange that he has never seen before has been suddenly shown, but on the curate addressing some further words to the same effect to her, sighing deeply she broke silence and said, Since the solitude of these mountains has been unable to conceal me, and the escape of my dishevelled tresses will not allow my tongue to deal in falsehoods, it would be idle for me now to make any further pretense of what, if you were to believe me, 
you would believe more out of courtesy than for any other reason. This being so, I say I thank you, sirs, for the offer you have made me, which places me under the obligation of complying with the request you have made of me, though I fear the account I shall give you of my misfortunes will excite in you as much concern as compassion, for you will be unable to suggest anything to remedy them or any consolation to alleviate them. However, that my honour may not be left a matter of doubt in your minds, now that you have discovered me to be a woman, and see that I am young, alone, and in this dress, things that taken together or separately would be enough to destroy any good name, I feel bound to tell what I would willingly keep secret if I could. All this she who was now seen to be a lovely woman delivered without any hesitation, with so much ease and in so sweet a voice that they were not less charmed by her intelligence than by her beauty, and as they again repeated their offers and entreaties to her to fulfil her promise, she without further pressing, first modestly covering her feet and gathering up her hair, seated herself on a stone with the three placed around her, and, after an effort to restrain some tears that came to her eyes, in a clear and steady voice began her story thus. In this Andalusia there is a town from which a duke takes a title which makes him one of those that are called grandees of Spain. This nobleman has two sons, the elder heir to his dignity and apparently to his good qualities, the younger heir to I know not what, unless it be the treachery of Valido and the falsehood of Ganalone. My parents are this lord's vassals, lowly in origin, but so wealthy that if birth had conferred as much on them as fortune, they would have had nothing left to desire, nor should I have had reason to fear trouble like that in which I find myself now, for it may be that my ill fortune came of theirs in not having been nobly born. It is true they are not so low that they have any reason to be ashamed of their condition, but neither are they so high as to remove from my mind the impression that my mishap comes of their humble birth. They are, in short, peasants, plain homely people, without any taint of disreputable blood, and, as the saying is, old rusty Christians, but so rich that by their wealth and free-handed way of life they are coming by degrees to be considered gentlefolk by birth, and even by position, though the wealth and nobility they thought most of was having me for their daughter, and as they have no other child to make their heir, and are affectionate parents, I was one of the most indulged daughters that ever parents indulged. I was the mirror in which they beheld themselves, the staff of their old age, and the object in which, with submission to heaven, all their wishes centred, and mine were in accordance with theirs, for I knew their worth, and as I was mistress of their hearts, so was I also of their possessions. Through me they engaged or dismissed their servants, through my hands passed the accounts and returns of what was sown and reaped, the oil mills, the wine presses, the count of the flocks and herds, the beehives, all in short that a rich farmer like my father has or can have, I had under my care, and I acted as steward and mistress with an assiduity on my part and satisfaction on theirs that I cannot well describe to you. The leisure hours left to me after I had given the requisite orders to the head shepherds, overseers, and other labourers, I passed in such employments as are not only allowable but necessary for young girls, those that the needle, embroidery cushion, and spinning will usually afford, and if to refresh my mind I quitted them for a while, I found recreation in reading some devotional book or playing the harp, for experience taught me that music soothes the troubled mind and relieves weariness of spirit. Such was the life I led in my parents' house and if I have depicted it thus minutely, it is not out of ostentation, or to let you know that I am rich, but that you may see how, without any fault of mine, I have fallen from the happy condition I have described, to the misery I am in at present. The truth is, that while I was leading this busy life, in a retirement that might compare with that of a monastery, and unseen as I thought by any except the servants of the house, for when I went to Mass it was so early in the morning, and I was so closely attended by my mother and the women of the household, and so thickly veiled and so shy, that my eyes scarcely saw more ground than I trod on, in spite of all this, the eyes of love, or idleness, more properly speaking, that the lynxes cannot rival, discovered me, with the help of the assiduity of Don Fernando, for that is the name of the younger son of the duke I told of. The moment the speaker mentioned the name of Don Fernando, Cardenio changed colour and broke into a sweat, with such signs of emotion that the curate and the barber, who observed it, feared that one of the mad fits which they heard attacked him sometimes was coming upon him but Cardenio showed no further agitation and remained quiet, regarding the peasant girl with fixed attention, for he began to suspect who she was. She, however, without noticing the excitement of Cardenio, continuing her story, went on to say. And they had hardly discovered me, when, as he owned afterwards, he was smitten with a violent love for me, as the manner in which it displayed itself plainly showed. But to shorten the long recital of my woes, I will pass over in silence all the artifices employed by Don Fernando for declaring his passion for me. He bribed all the household, he gave and offered gifts and presents to my parents, every day was like a holiday or a merrymaking in our street, by night no one could sleep for the music, the love letters that used to come to my hand, no one knew how, 
were innumerable, full of tender pleadings and pledges, containing more promises and oaths than there were letters in them, all which not only did not soften me, but harden my heart against him, as if he had been my mortal enemy, and as if everything he did to make me yield were done with the opposite intention. Not that the highbred bearing of Don Fernando was disagreeable to me, or that I found his importunities wearisome, for it gave me a certain sort of satisfaction to find myself so sought and prized by a gentleman of such distinction, and I was not displeased at seeing my praises in his letters, for however ugly we women may be, it seems to me it always pleases us to hear ourselves called beautiful, but that my own sense of right was opposed to all this, as well as the repeated advice of my parents, who now very plainly perceived Don Fernando's purpose, for he cared very little if all the world knew it. They told me they trusted and confided their honour and good name to my virtue and rectitude alone, and bade me consider the disparity between Don Fernando and myself, from which I might conclude that his intentions, whatever he might say to the contrary, had for their aim his own pleasure rather than my advantage, and if I were at all desirous of opposing an obstacle to his unreasonable suit, they were ready, they said, to marry me at once to anyone I preferred, either among the leading people of our own town, or of any of those in the neighbourhood, for with their wealth and my good name, a match might be looked for in any quarter. This offer, and their sound advice strengthened my resolution, and I never gave Don Fernando a word in reply that could hold out to him any hope of success, however remote. All this caution of mine, which he must have taken for coyness, had apparently the effect of increasing his want and appetite, for that is the name I give to his passion for me. Had it been what he declared it to be, you would not know of it now, because there would have been no occasion to tell you of it. At length he learned that my parents were contemplating marriage for me in order to put an end to his hopes of obtaining possession of me, or at least to secure additional protectors to watch over me, and this intelligence or suspicion made him act as you shall hear. One night, as I was in my chamber with no other companion than a damsel who waited on me, with the doors carefully locked lest my honour should be imperilled through any carelessness, I know not nor can conceive how it happened, but, with all this seclusion and these precautions, and in the solitude and silence of my retirement, I found him standing before me, a vision that so astounded me that it deprived my eyes of sight, and my tongue of speech. I had no power to utter a cry, nor, I think, did he give me time to utter one, as he immediately approached me, and taking me in his arms, for, overwhelmed as I was, I was powerless, I say, to help myself, he began to make such professions to me that I know not how falsehood could have had the power of dressing them up to seem so like truth, and the traitor contrived that his tears should vouch for his words, and his sighs for his sincerity. I, a poor young creature alone, ill-versed among my people in cases such as this, began, I know not how, to think all these lying protestations true, though without being moved by his sighs and tears to anything more than pure compassion, and so, as the first feeling of bewilderment passed away, and I began in some degree to recover myself, I said to him with more courage than I thought I could have possessed, if, as I am now in your arms, Signor, I were in the claws of a fierce lion, and my deliverance could be procured by doing or saying anything to the prejudice of my honour, it would no more be in my power to do it or say it, than it would be possible that what was should not have been, so then, if you hold my body clasped in your arms, I hold my soul secured by virtuous intentions, very different from yours, as you will see if you attempt to carry them into effect by force. I am your vassal, but I am not your slave, your nobility neither has nor should have any right to dishonour or degrade my humble birth, and low-born peasant as I am, I have my self-respect as much as you, a lord and gentleman, with me your violence will be to no purpose, your wealth will have no weight, your words will have no power to deceive me, nor your sighs or tears to soften me, were I to see any of the things I speak of in him whom my parents gave me as a husband, his will should be mine, and mine should be bounded by his, and my honour being preserved even though my inclinations were not would willingly yield him what you, Senor, would now obtain by force, and this I say lest you should suppose that any but my lawful husband shall ever win anything of me. If that, said this disloyal gentleman, be the only scruple you feel, fairest Dorothea, for that is the name of this unhappy being, see here I give you my hand to be yours, and let heaven, from which nothing is hid, and this image of Our Lady you have here, be witnesses of this pledge. When Cardenio heard her say she was called Dorothea, he showed fresh agitation and felt convinced of the truth of his former suspicion, but he was unwilling to interrupt the story, and wished to hear the end of what he already all but knew, so he merely said. What? Is Dorothea your name, Signora? I have heard of another of the same name who can perhaps match your misfortunes. But proceed, by and by I may tell you something that will astonish you as much as it will excite your compassion. Dorothea was struck by Cardenio's words as well as by his strange and miserable attire, and begged him if he knew anything concerning her to tell it to her at once, for if fortune had left her any blessing it was courage to bear whatever calamity might fall upon her, 
as she felt sure that none could reach her capable of increasing in any degree what she endured already. I would not let the occasion pass, senora, replied Cardenio, of telling you what I think, if what I suspect were the truth, but so far there has been no opportunity, nor is it of any importance to you to know it. Be it as it may, replied Dorothea, what happened in my story was that Don Fernando, taking an image that stood in the chamber, placed it as a witness of our betrothal, and with the most binding words and extravagant oaths gave me his promise to become my husband, though before he had made an end of pledging himself I bade him consider well what he was doing, and think of the anger his father would feel at seeing him married to a peasant girl in one of his vassals, I told him not to let my beauty, such as it was, blind him, for that was not enough to furnish an excuse for his transgression, and if in the love he bore me he wished to do me any kindness, it would be to leave my lot to follow its course at the level my condition required, for marriages so unequal never brought happiness, nor did they continue long to afford the enjoyment they began with. All this that I have now repeated I said to him, and much more which I cannot recollect, but it had no effect in inducing him to forego his purpose, he who has no intention of paying does not trouble himself about difficulties when he is striking the bargain. At the same time I argued the matter briefly in my own mind, saying to myself, I shall not be the first who has risen through marriage from a lowly to a lofty station, nor will Don Fernando be the first whom beauty or, as is more likely, a blind attachment, has led to mate himself below his rank. Then, since I am introducing no new usage or practice, I may as well avail myself of the honour that chance offers me, for even though his inclination for me should not outlast the attainment of his wishes, I shall be, after all, his wife before God. And if I strive to repel him by scorn, I can see that, fair means failing, he is in a mood to use force, and I shall be left dishonoured and without any means of proving my innocence to those who cannot know how innocently I have come to be in this position, for what arguments would persuade my parents that this gentleman entered my chamber without my consent? All these questions and answers passed through my mind in a moment, but the oaths of Don Fernando, the witnesses he appealed to, the tears he shed, and lastly the charms of his person and his high-bred grace, which, accompanied by such signs of genuine love, might well have conquered a heart even more free and coy than mine, these were the things that more than all began to influence me and lead me unawares to my ruin. I called my waiting maid to me, that there might be a witness on earth besides those in heaven, and again Don Fernando renewed and repeated his oaths, invoked his witnesses fresh saints in addition to the former ones, called down upon himself a thousand curses hereafter should he fail to keep his promise, shed more tears, redoubled his sighs and pressed me closer in his arms, from which he had never allowed me to escape, and so I was left by my maid, and ceased to be one, and he became a traitor and a perjured man. The day which followed the night of my misfortune did not come so quickly, I imagine, as Don Fernando wished, for when desire has attained its object, the greatest pleasure is to fly from the scene of pleasure. I say so because Don Fernando made all haste to leave me, and by the adroitness of my maid, who was indeed the one who had admitted him, gained the street before daybreak, but on taking leave of me he told me, though not with as much earnestness and fervour as when he came, that I might rest assured of his faith and of the sanctity and sincerity of his oaths, and to confirm his words he drew a rich ring off his finger and placed it upon mine. He then took his departure and I was left, I know not whether sorrowful or happy, all I can say is, I was left agitated and troubled in mind and almost bewildered by what had taken place, and I had not the spirit, or else it did not occur to me, to chide my maid for the treachery she had been guilty of in concealing Don Fernando in my chamber, for as yet I was unable to make up my mind whether what had befallen me was for good or evil. I told Don Fernando at parting, that as I was now his, he might see me on other nights in the same way, until it should be his pleasure to let the matter become known, but, except the following night, he came no more, nor for more than a month could I catch a glimpse of him in the street or in church, while I wearied myself with watching for one, although I knew he was in the town, and almost every day went out hunting, a pastime he was very fond of. I remember well how sad and dreary those days and hours were to me, I remember well how I began to doubt as they went by, and even to lose confidence in the faith of Don Fernando, and I remember, too, how my maid heard those words in reproof of her audacity that she had not heard before, and how I was forced to put a constraint on my tears and on the expression of my countenance, not to give my parents cause to ask me why I was so melancholy, and drive me to invent falsehoods in reply. But all this was suddenly brought to an end, for the time came when all such considerations were disregarded, and there was no further question of honour, when my patience gave way and the secret of my heart became known abroad. The reason was, that a few days later it was reported in the town that Don Fernando had been married in a neighbouring city to a maiden of rare beauty, the daughter of parents of distinguished position, though not so rich that her portion would entitle her to look for so brilliant a match, it was said, too, that her name was Lucinda, and that at the betrothal some strange things had happened. Cardenio heard the name of Lucinda, 
but he only shrugged his shoulders, bit his lips, bent his brows, and before long two streams of tears escaped from his eyes. Dorothea, however, did not interrupt her story, but went on in these words. This sad intelligence reached my ears, and, instead of being struck with a chill, with such wrath and fury did my heart burn that I scarcely restrained myself from rushing out into the streets, crying aloud and proclaiming openly the perfidy and treachery of which I was the victim, but this transport of rage was for the time checked by a resolution I formed, to be carried out the same night, and that was to assume this dress, which I got from a servant of my father's, one of the Zigals, as they are called in farmhouses, to whom I confided the whole of my misfortune, and whom I entreated to accompany me to the city where I heard my enemy was. He, though he remonstrated with me for my boldness, and condemned my resolution, when he saw me bent upon my purpose, offered to bear me company, as he said, to the end of the world. I at once packed up in a linen pillowcase a woman's dress, and some jewels and money to provide for emergencies, and in the silence of the night, without letting my treacherous maid know, I sallied forth from the house, accompanied by my servant and abundant anxieties, and on foot set out for the city, but borne as it were on wings by my eagerness to reach it, if not to prevent what I presumed to be already done, at least to call upon Don Fernando to tell me with what conscience he had done it. I reached my destination in two days and a half, and on entering the city inquired for the house of Lucinda's parents. The first person I asked gave me more in reply than I sought to know, he showed me the house, and told me all that had occurred at the betrothal of the daughter of the family, an affair of such notoriety in the city that it was the talk of every knot of idlers in the street. He said that on the night of Don Fernando's betrothal with Lucinda, as soon as she had consented to be his bride by saying yes, she was taken with a sudden fainting fit, and that on the bridegroom approaching to unlace the bosom of her dress to give her air, he found a paper in her own handwriting, in which she said and declared that she could not be Don Fernando's bride, because she was already Cardenio's, who, according to the man's account, was a gentleman of distinction of the same city, and that as she had accepted Don Fernando, it was only in obedience to her parents. In short, he said, the words of the paper made it clear she meant to kill herself on the completion of the betrothal, and gave her reasons for putting an end to herself all which was confirmed, it was said, by a dagger they found somewhere in her clothes. On seeing this, Don Fernando, persuaded that Lucinda had befooled, slighted, and trifled with him, assailed her before she had recovered from her swoon, and tried to stab her with the dagger that had been found, and would have succeeded had not her parents and those who were present prevented him. It was said, moreover, that Don Fernando went away at once, and that Lucinda did not recover from her prostration until the next day, when she told her parents how she was really the bride of that Cardenio I have mentioned. I learned besides that Cardenio, according to report, had been present at the betrothal, and that upon seeing her betrothed contrary to his expectation, he had quitted the city in despair, leaving behind him a letter declaring the wrong Lucinda had done him, and his intention of going where no one should ever see him again. All this was a matter of notoriety in the city, and every one spoke of it, especially when it became known that Lucinda was missing from her father's house and from the city, for she was not to be found anywhere, to the distraction of her parents, who knew not what steps to take to recover her. What had learned revived my hopes, and I was better pleased not to have found Don Fernando than to find him married, for it seemed to me that the door was not yet entirely shut upon relief in my case, and I thought that perhaps heaven had put this impediment in the way of the second marriage, to lead him to recognize his obligations under the former one, and reflect that as a Christian he was bound to consider his soul above all human objects. All this passed through my mind, and I strove to comfort myself without comfort, indulging in faint and distant hopes of cherishing that life that I now abhor. But while I was in the city, uncertain what to do, as I could not find Don Fernando, I heard notice given by the public crier offering a great reward to anyone who should find me, and giving the particulars of my age and of the very dress I wore, and I heard it said that the lad who came with me had taken me away from my father's house, a thing that cut me to the heart, showing how low my good name had fallen, since it was not enough that I should lose it by my flight, but they must add with whom I had fled, and that one so much beneath me and so unworthy of my consideration. The instant I heard the notice I quitted the city with my servant, who now began to show signs of wavering in his fidelity to me, and the same night, for fear of discovery, we entered the most thickly wooded part of these mountains. But, as is commonly said, one evil calls up another and the end of one misfortune is apt to be the beginning of one still greater, and so it proved in my case, for my worthy servant, until then so faithful and trusty when he found me in this lonely spot, moved more by his own villainy than by my beauty, sought to take advantage of the opportunity which these solitudes seemed to present him, and with little shame and less fear of God and respect for me, began to make overtures to me, and finding that I replied to the effrontery of his proposals with justly severe language, he laid aside the entreaties which he had employed at first, and began to use violence. 
but just heaven, that seldom fails to watch over and aid good intentions, so aided mine that with my slight strength and with little exertion I pushed him over a precipice, where I left him, whether dead or alive I know not, and then, with greater speed than seemed possible in my terror and fatigue, I made my way into the mountains, without any other thought or purpose save that of hiding myself among them, and escaping my father and those dispatched in search of me by his orders. It is now I know not how many months since with this object I came here, where I met a herdsman who engaged me as his servant at a place in the heart of this Sierra, and all this time I have been serving him as herd, striving to keep always a field to hide these locks which have now unexpectedly betrayed me. But all my care and pains were unavailing, for my master made the discovery that I was not a man, and harbored the same base designs as my servant, and as fortune does not always supply a remedy in cases of difficulty, and I had no precipice or ravine at hand down which to fling the master and cure his passion, as I had in the servant's case, I thought it a lesser evil to leave him and again conceal myself among these crags, than make trial of my strength and argument with him. So, as I say, once more I went into hiding to seek for some place where I might with sighs and tears implore heaven to have pity on my misery, and grant me help and strength to escape from it, or let me die among the solitudes, leaving no trace of an unhappy being who, by no fault of hers, has furnished matter for talk and scandal at home and abroad. Ego聞き流しリスニング英語テキストとMP3ダウンロードその他の物語はホームページからお聞きいただけます。88thpp.com88thpp.com